Hi everyone, it's Katrina. Sea monsters in North America. 300 million years ago, parts of North America were covered by a shallow tropical sea. At the time, the Mason Creek area in what is now Illinois was home to numerous soft-bodied animals. One of the most bizarre discoveries scientists have made there is the Tully monster. The creature resembles a slug at first glance, but it had a long, thin appendage with what looked like grasping claws where you would expect its mouth to be, and its eyes were located at the end of stalks that protruded from its body. It's downright weird, looking like a collection of leftover sea creature parts. And for decades since its discovery, scientists have been trying to figure out exactly what it was. They can't seem to agree on whether it was a vertebrate, meaning it had a backbone, or an invertebrate, meaning it didn't have one. In 2016, a group of researchers claimed to have finally solved the mystery. They argued that the Tully monster was a vertebrate because its eyes have more in common with animals who have backbones. The team concluded that the creature is a jawless fish that's distantly related to modern-day lampreys. But another group of experts identified several invertebrates who also have the eye features that the other scientists used for classifying the creature, calling the accuracy of their findings into question. It seems as though the more researchers look into the matter, the more confusing it gets, and they are left with more questions than answers. Bugs were gigantic. Some of the largest insects that ever existed were giant dragonfly-like predators called griffinflies. They looked a lot like modern-day dragonflies, but are only distantly related to them and were much bigger, with bodies measuring over a foot and a half long and with wingspans of up to two and a half feet. These primitive insects appeared on the fossil record between 317 million and 247 million years ago. They lived before the dinosaurs, but didn't exist for very long. There are two known griffinfly species, both of which were identified based on fossils found in North America. Griffinflies evolved to their massive size because the atmosphere's oxygen content was much higher at the time. This made breathing much easier than it is for today's insects and caused them to grow to be enormous. These freakishly huge creatures died out during the end Permian extinction event. It was the most devastating of the five known extinction events to happen on Earth and wiped out around 90% of the planet's species. Known as the Great Dying, it's one of the few extinction events that saw a massive die-off of insects. The world's oxygen levels decreased and insects never grew to their ancestors' enormous size, which I'm kind of okay with. Do bugs freak you out? What would you do if they were that huge now? Let me know in the comments. Move very gracefully. Scientist Christine Janis, who led a study on these prehistoric marsupials, told Life Science that they were probably unable to hop due to their enormous size. She explained that smaller prehistoric kangaroos may have been able to hop sometimes, but they weren't efficient at it. They probably plodded along using their two legs, as opposed to moving on all fours and using their tail as a fifth leg like modern-day kangaroos. They also lacked a flexible spine, long legs, and a large tail, which are all advantageous for hopping. Kangaroo movement is a widely debated topic in the scientific world. Did you know that? Janice and her team's findings point strongly toward the theory that kangaroos evolved to hop and that this possibly happened more than once. The research also raises the question of whether these giant ancestors went extinct because they were unable to escape human hunters or reach food during a period of climate change. Unicorns were real. Unicorns back in the day were real to a certain extent. A prehistoric creature nicknamed the Siberian Unicorn looked nothing like the mythical creatures we picture in our minds. As an ancient rhino species, it was fatter and furrier than the unicorn of modern imagination, but it did have an enormous horn. Scientists originally thought that the Siberian Unicorn went extinct at least 100,000 years ago, but a 2016 study found that the animal was still roaming the Earth as recently as 39,000 years ago, meaning it lived alongside Neanderthals and ancient humans. But how did the species survive for so long? The study was based on a fossilized specimen found in Kazakhstan. Researcher Andrei Spansky told CNN that the region was probably a refuge of sorts for the Siberian unicorn, enabling it to continue to thrive after it died out elsewhere. But this was just the beginning of all the questions experts still need to answer. They are hoping to figure out what caused the Siberian unicorn to go extinct, if migration played a role in its survival, 
and if climate change had anything to do with it dying out. There are only about five species of rhinos living today, but there have been as many as 250 species throughout different points in time. The Siberian unicorn lived in an area that spans from modern-day southwestern Russia and Ukraine to Siberia and Kazakhstan. It weighed as much as 3.9 tons, up to two times the size of a modern-day rhino, and it was a fast runner, despite its colossal proportions. Experts believe, based on how rhinos behave now, that the Siberian unicorn may have been a rare and solitary animal. There are no signs that people hunted them to extinction, but their low population numbers may have played a role, and climate change is a suspected factor. Dinosaurs had feathers Dinosaurs started to look more bird-like starting in 1964, when a researcher hypothesized that a species called Deinonychus was warm-blooded based on its fossil. In 1979, scientist John McLaughlin suggested in his book that there were many warm-blooded and feathered dinosaurs, and the idea continued to spread from there. The first solid evidence of dinosaurs having feathers came during the 1990s, with the discovery of some perfectly preserved specimens in China. This proved that dinosaurs were the ancestors of today's birds. More feathered dinosaurs have been found since then, but experts are still trying to figure out how many dinosaurs actually had feathers, and when feathers first appeared. A study found that most feathered dinosaurs came from the meat-eating theropod branch of the family tree. Some experts believe that all dinosaurs had at least some feathers, but some species may have only had a few feathers, which are unlikely to be preserved in their fossils. Other scientists think that many dinosaurs had feather-like structures, but only those closest related to modern birds had true feathers. Recent research suggests that the earliest dinosaurs were featherless, or if they did have feathers, the feathers didn't fossilize. But the evidence indicates that certain species had scaly coverings instead of feathers, so scientists still have a lot to learn about this. Stay tuned, because their findings are likely to change in the future as more discoveries are made. Whales did not always live in the ocean Most modern animals started out as ocean dwellers and eventually made their way to land. But the earliest ancestors of modern whales did the opposite. Equipped with long skulls and carnivorous teeth, these land-dwelling creatures didn't look much like whales at first glance. But their skulls strongly resemble those of today's whales and their ear bone had a feature that is unique to cetaceans. Pachycetus was one of the first whales. This four-footed animal lived along the shore of a shallow ocean called the Tethys Sea in what is now Pakistan. Measuring anywhere from one to two meters long, it was roughly the size of a wolf. It looked more like a hoofed animal than a sea creature. Whales began adapting to an aquatic environment around 50 million years ago, when they entered the water in search of food or to hide from predators. As they evolved, their legs grew smaller and their tails became longer and more muscular. Take for example Bacillosaurus, a prehistoric species that flourished around 37 million years ago. It had two small, perfectly developed hind legs that it did not use for swimming, and which were relatively useless. Eventually, these limbs disappeared entirely. It took only 10 million years for whales to adapt completely to a marine environment. This may seem like a long time, but from an evolutionary perspective, it's a very fast transition. Ancient bears make modern bears look small. The idea of crossing paths with an angry grizzly bear or a polar bear is terrifying to most people. But imagine being in the direct path of a bear that stands at 12 feet tall on its hind legs and barrels at you at up to 40 miles per hour. That's what you would have had to deal with in an encounter with the giant short-faced bear the fastest running bear and one of the largest land animals that ever lived. Armed with longer legs than today's bears and straight forward-facing toes, these terrifying creatures moved with impressive speed despite their massive size. These guys weighed up to 3,500 pounds. There were North American and South American species and they were very different from each other. South American short-faced bears shrunk over time. Scientists aren't sure what they ate, but think that a dwindling food supply may be to blame for these apex predators getting smaller. They may have also faced increased competition as other animals evolved and got bigger. North American short-faced bears, on the other hand, grew larger over time. This may have given them the advantage of being able to scare off other predators from their meal. The reasons why either bear went extinct are unknown. 
but scientists think it had to do with increased competition for food. Dinosaurs performed mating dances. Scientists have long suspected that as ancestors of modern birds, dinosaurs performed mating dances. They finally found evidence of this in 2016, when paleontologists discovered scrape marks left behind by dinosaurs in Colorado. Found in 100 million year old sandstone, the 50 or so marks look a lot like the patterns left behind by birds who are looking for a partner. A team of researchers ruled out the possibilities of the marks representing a nest or foraging for food or water. Speaking with The Guardian, lead scientist Martin Lockley said that he thinks dinosaurs made vocal sounds while mating, just as modern birds do. The team failed to determine what dinosaur species made the scrape marks, but they suspect that the Acrocanthosaurus may be responsible. Measuring up to 35 feet long and weighing between 5 and 6 tons, this giant theropod was around the same size as the Tyrannosaurus rex. Now that they think they've figured out dinosaur foreplay, scientists are trying to learn more about how they actually mated. Duckbill Dinosaurs Around 70 million years ago, a group of plant-eating dinosaurs called hadrosaurs roamed the areas that are now Europe, Asia, and the Americas. These so-called duckbill dinosaurs are best known for the flat, beak-like appearance of the bones in their snout. They also had webbed front feet. Duckbill dinosaurs had bulky bodies. Scientists think that they were able to run on two feet, but that they usually used all four. One of the most interesting duckbill dinosaurs is the Hypacrosaurus, a type that was discovered in 1910. There are two known species based on fossils found in Alberta, Canada, and Montana. When the Hypacrosaurus was first discovered, it was the second largest known dinosaur next to the Tyrannosaurus rex. Many larger dinosaurs have been discovered since then, but at 30 feet long and up to 4.4 tons, the creature was formidable in its own right. Writing for Scientific American in 2018, paleontologist Darren Nash pointed out that it's a common misconception to assume that duckbilled dinosaurs were actually duckbilled. Their nickname is based on the shape of their bones, without factoring in what they might have looked like with cartilage, muscle, and other tissues. In fact, Evidence shows that these dinosaurs probably had a large downturned bill that concealed the flattened shape of its bones. Global warming caused dwarfism. Around 55 million years ago, the Earth experienced an extreme warming period, or hyperthermal, called the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum, or PETM. Global temperatures rose between 9 and 14 degrees over a 160,000 year period. During that time, primates, horses, deer, and other mammals shrunk. In 2013, scientists found that this mammal dwarfing happened at least one other time during a smaller global warming event around 53 million years ago. Known as the Eocene Thermal Maximum II, it lasted for around 80,000 years. It also caused animals to shrink, but not as much as they did in the first warming event. Scientists say it's happening now as well, in our current era of climate change, according to a recent study. Over a 23-year period from 1976 to 1999, scientists observed changes in the body size of a bird called the mountain wagtail. They found that lighter birds were replacing heavier ones, and that they are better at handling hot temperatures. This indicates that evolution is causing these changes to help the birds survive the rapidly changing climate. Other studies have yielded similar findings, but there is no saying how each animal will respond to the rising global temperature. By learning more about how animals were affected in the past, experts may be able to better predict what to expect in the future. Theseus and the Minotaur Theseus and the Minotaur is one of the most famous stories in Greek mythology. For those who are unfamiliar with the tale, it starts with King Minos of Crete. He prayed to Poseidon for a snow-white bull after winning his kingship and exiling his brother. The bull was to be a sign of the god's approval. He was then supposed to sacrifice the bull when it appeared, but he found it too beautiful to kill, so he kept it. Poseidon was so furious that he caused the king's wife to fall in love with the bull, and she gave birth to a minotaur, a half-man, half-bull monster. As the Minotaur grew older, it became more and more violent. Since it was neither man nor beast, it began to eat people. On advice from the oracle, the king built a massive labyrinth beneath the palace to hide the result of his wife's affair. 
King Minos's only human son was killed by the Athenians. So as revenge, he continuously attacked them without mercy until they agreed to send seven young men and seven young women as tribute who would be sent down into the labyrinth as sacrifice for the Minotaur. Tired of this reign of terror, Theseus, son of King Aegeus, volunteered to go in order to slay the creature. The daughters of King Minos fell in love with him and decided to help him escape the deadly labyrinth. Princess Ariadne gave Prince Theseus a ball of thread to help him find his way. He slayed the Minotaur and was able to get back out, taking the other Athenians and the princesses with him. But how much of this legend is true? The palace of King Minos was discovered by Sir Arthur Evans in 1894. We know it today as the Palace of Knossos. What's truly spectacular is that underneath the palace, archaeologists found the ruins of an extremely complex labyrinth. The labyrinth, before being abandoned and left to crumble, was so elaborate that it would have almost been impossible to find your way out without a map. Now, we don't know that Theseus was a real hero, and it's doubtful that a minotaur was ever a real creature. But archaeologists have proven that both the palace and the labyrinth were real, giving quite a bit of credibility to this myth. The Legend of Mulan Mulan is well known these days as a popular Disney animated film. One that was so well loved, they recently made the live action version as well. But what a lot of fans don't know is that the character Mulan is actually based on a Chinese ballad. What's even more interesting is that the ballad may actually be based on a real person named Mulan from Chinese history. The earliest written evidence of Mulan being a real person dates back to the Northern Dynasties between 386 and 581 AD. The Ballad of Mulan is no more than 300 words, describing the story of a girl who dresses up like a man to join the army instead of her father. It's the exact same story as the movie. At the end of the ballad, Mulan is celebrated as one of the best and most powerful warriors, and then she reveals herself to actually be a woman. While there isn't any direct evidence of this happening, the ballad does give some clues. The epic poem mentions two main locations, the Yellow River and the Yan Mountain. This suggests that Mulan's hometown was somewhere near these two landmarks. The poem also suggests that Mulan was a member of the nomadic group called the Tuoba, a clan that came from northern China and established the Northern Wei Dynasty. This is because in the poem, the emperor goes by the title Khan, making it likely that Mulan came from a nomadic society descended from the splintered Mongols. These people were known for giving women a respected status in society, whereas this kind of behavior was eventually lost in China. So Mulan may have actually been real, remembered and passed down through poetry. The Battle of Salamis the Battle of Salamis is one of the most legendary battles in history. Fought between the Persians and the Greeks in September of 480 BC, it was one of the most important military battles in ancient history and a pivotal point for Europe. If the Greeks had lost this fight, the Persians would have successfully invaded and altered history as we know it today. The battle took place just off the coast of Attica in Greece. While we do know that the battle itself definitely happened, we don't know how many of the legends surrounding it are true. It's said that the Greek city-states fought as allies, bringing 370 ships to battle. But the Persians had over 1,000 ships. King Xerxes assumed that he would annihilate the Greek fleet thanks to his overwhelming numbers. But what apparently happened was that the Greek commander Themistocles lured the Persian ships through the Strait of Salamis, just like in the movie 300, except on boats. The huge fleet couldn't fit through the strait, which led to chaos and disorganization, and the much smaller fleet of 370 Greek ships brought them all down. This definitely could have happened, but we don't know for sure if these numbers are real. Perhaps it was a brilliant battle strategy. Perhaps the ever-powerful and mysterious Greek fire gave the ships the upper hand. If the legendary accounts from the battle are true, then it just goes to show how mighty and good at battle tactics the ancient Greeks really were. The Lost Labyrinth of Egypt Did you know that there is a mysterious lost wonder in Egypt that could have even surpassed the Great Pyramids themselves? The Great Lost Labyrinth of Egypt first appears in writings from the Greek historian Herodotus in the 5th century BC. 
He himself claimed that he saw the building, calling it even more impressive than the pyramids of Giza. The Greek historian also claimed that the labyrinth was located along the shores of a massive lake over seven days from the pyramids. There was a great temple divided into huge sections to make up the labyrinth, which was almost inescapable. There were subterranean passages, colossal figures, and even small pyramids entwined with the other structures. It was a massive complex unlike anything else in the ancient world, or even since. Legend says the labyrinth was so big that once you became lost, the only way to find your way out was with a secret map or a book. Unfortunately, this great labyrinth has never actually been discovered by modern archaeologists. We aren't sure if it truly existed. There were some vague reports back in 2008 that radar specialists had uncovered an underground labyrinth beneath a temple near Cairo. But this supposed discovery was never authenticated or investigated further. Or at least nothing has been published yet. While it's definitely possible that the Egyptians built a labyrinth that would make their pyramids look like children's toys, evidence to support this ancient legend is yet to be discovered. Pele the Volcano Goddess Pele is the goddess of Kilauea in Hawaii, ruler of fire and volcanoes. According to Hawaiian legend, Pele arrived in Hawaii after being kicked out of her homeland in Tahiti. She crossed the ocean in a canoe, but her sister was in hot pursuit because Pele had messed around with her husband. Pele's sister nearly killed her, but she survived by digging giant fire pits, what we know of today as Hawaii's many volcanoes. Pele's sister eventually learned she was still alive and went back to finish the job. Through all the fighting, the great forests of Hawaii were burned down. Pele's sister killed her in the end, and Pele became a goddess. There are a lot of different iterations of this story, but the foundations remain the same. And while these goddesses never physically existed, some parts of the story may have actually happened. Specifically, the forest being burned by the volcanoes. Scientists know today that lava flowed continuously for over 60 years in the 15th century, covering a massive part of Hawaii in lava. The local Polynesians may have interpreted what they saw as a great battle between gods, making up their own legends about it. These legends persisted, became myth, and have mostly now been forgotten. Even though Pele herself probably never existed, this is a great example of how real events inspire stories which can turn into legends and even turn into religions. And now for an amazing creature we all wish was still around. But first, wanted to give a big shout out to Nathan Sama and Jessica Greening, who has been around practically since the beginning. Thanks so much for watching, and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already to join the Origins Explained family. Unicorns Unicorns were once very real animals. There is a reason why unicorns have been prevalent in mythologies throughout the East and West for thousands of years. But the catch is a little creepy. Unicorns probably didn't start out as white horses with golden horns that contained magical powers. They also probably didn't have tears that could heal the wounded or blood that could grant immortality. Instead, the unicorn was probably a furry rhinoceros that went extinct sometime around 29,000 years ago. National Geographic reports that the fossilized skull of a fuzzy rhinoceros was discovered in Kazakhstan, with a single horn protruding from its head. The beast was over 4 tons, over 12 feet long, and probably around 6 feet tall. It would have been absolutely massive, and a real source of inspiration for Neolithic people. It's highly possible that our ancestors lived alongside these mysterious rhinoceros-like creatures for several thousand years. After they went extinct, stories about these majestic creatures continued. This is why all over the world, unicorns are seen slightly differently in ancient legends. Sometimes the unicorn is a deer, sometimes a donkey, and sometimes a goat. The only consistent attribute is a single horn sticking out of its forehead. What are your thoughts on the legendary unicorn? Do you think it was a fuzzy rhinoceros or was it inspired by something else? Let me know in the comments below and remember to subscribe if you haven't already. The 12 Labors of Hercules Hercules is arguably the most famous legendary hero that we still talk about today. And according to historians, he was likely a real person. He probably wasn't the son of Zeus, and it's unlikely that he ever fought a hydra or killed a chimera. But his famous 12 labors may have actually been done by someone during the Stone Age. 
Hercules had many enemies before he was even born. Zeus had an affair with a mortal, and when his wife Hera found out, she set out to destroy baby Hercules. As he grew up, he married and had children, but Hera cast an evil spell on him and made him murder his own family. Hercules went to Apollo and begged for punishment, and so to atone for his sins, Apollo ordered him to perform 12 labors for the Mycenaean king. They included fighting monsters, cleaning stables, and stealing cattle from a giant. One of his greatest enemies was the Nemean lion, an exceptionally strong and murderous lion. Then there was the Hydra, a nine-headed venomous snake monster. Historians say there may have been an extraordinarily strong warrior from the Stone Age who accomplished many extraordinary feats. But instead of killing monsters, he had probably slain a very large lion, maybe captured a bunch of snakes, and stole cattle from a rival tribe. Through the centuries, the story of Hercules and his twelve labors was picked up by other civilizations and passed on and on. Everybody loves a hero. The original hero may have been an ordinary guy with a club and some lion fur, and perhaps he was lucky and so people thought the gods were with him. The Great Flood Scientists agree that there was once a great flood that blanketed many parts of the world in water. This flood happened at the dawn of modern history, devastating the region of Mesopotamia. Back during excavations in 1928, archaeologists at a pair of ancient sites, Ur and Kish, uncovered evidence of flood deposits. There was definitely some flooding in Mesopotamia at the dawn of civilization, and the flooding had probably affected other places as well, all around the Mediterranean. This shared experience was then passed down from generation to generation. According to Robert Ballard, one of the best underwater archaeologists on the planet, 12,000 years ago the world was covered in ice. In Connecticut, the ice was about a mile high, and this went all the way up to the North Pole. So when all this ice started to melt at the end of the Ice Age, it caused the world's sea levels to rise, leading to the great flooding of Mesopotamia. But now for the big question. Does all this flooding directly correlate to the story of Noah and his ark in the Bible? Was the great biblical flood a very real thing? This is one legend with a shocking amount of truth. While there are still archaeologists out searching for the ark that Noah built, it is clear that a great flood devastated the world just as humanity was getting started. The Oracle The Oracle of Delphi was one of the most important women in the ancient world of Greece. She was a priestess at the Temple of Apollo who practiced divination, or seeing the future. One of the biggest mistakes people make when thinking about the oracle is that she was just one person. This simply isn't true. There were many oracles, each one a real woman selected by priests at the sanctuary of Delphi to foretell the future at the temple. They were actually known as Pythia, and when one died, another would take her place. Thanks to historical records and archaeological evidence, we know there really were oracles and that the Greeks took their visions of the future very seriously. But unlike the myths, they probably didn't actually have special powers. Scientists believe that the Temple of Apollo where the oracle gave her proclamations was built over a ground fissure. It was from this fissure that gases rose up from deep within the earth. When the oracle inhaled these fumes, she went into a kind of trance but not because the gods were speaking to her, but because she was getting affected by the toxic fumes. What the ancient people saw as a state of divine ecstasy has a scientific explanation. But back in ancient times, science and the divine were one. Heat and gas escaping from dark caves and cracks in the ground implied that it was the entrance to the underworld. And who was to say any different? King Arthur King Arthur may have been a real person and may have even sat at a round table in Camelot. There has been debate raging for centuries among historians as to Arthur's existence. His first appearance in written history was around the year 1000. The Welsh historian Nennius published a list of 12 epic battles that King Arthur had fought in. He was supposedly a Celtic hero who helped defend Wales against the invading Saxon armies. And kind of like Hercules, his original mentions in history were pretty boring. He was basically a really good king who fought a lot of battles. But by the 12th century, Arthur had a magic sword called Excalibur, a wizard named Merlin, and a whole group of trusted knights. 
Somewhere along the way, somebody who may have been a real person turned into a character from a storybook. But there are some problems with the stories, like the fact that the 12 battles Arthur was supposedly involved in took place over so many different times that it would have been impossible for him to participate in all of them. Then there's the issue with Camelot, his legendary castle. While there are about half a dozen mysterious strongholds across the Welsh and English border that could have been Camelot, none of them have ever been authenticated. King Arthur may really have been a king, or he may have just been a character thought up by a Welsh historian a thousand years ago. The truth is that we just don't know. Anglo-Saxon Warlord Sometime during the 6th century, an Anglo-Saxon man died and was buried in Berkshire, England. He was laid to rest with an array of weapons, including spears and a sword. Archaeologists unearthed the man's skeleton last year after a metal detectorist discovered bronze bowls at the site. They believe that he may have been a warrior, but it's also possible that he was buried with weapons as a symbolic gesture, according to Dr. Gabor Thomas, who specializes in early medieval archaeology. Dr. Thomas also explained that being macho at this period was a significant part of people's lives. Known as the Marlowe Warlord, the man was around six feet tall, and his skeleton indicates that he was very muscular. Based on his grave goods, it's clear that he was wealthy and was buried separately from the rest of the community overlooking the Thames River. This indicates that the man was of a high-ranking social status and possibly a tribal leader. During Anglo-Saxon times, the area that the Marlowe Warlord lived in was a borderland that kingdoms often fought over. According to Thomas, his burial suggests that a powerful tribe inhabited the region before other kingdoms encroached on their territory. Tests are being carried out on the skeleton to determine the man's age and see if he had any medical conditions. Ancient Tobacco Archaeologists working in the Utah desert have uncovered evidence that people used tobacco as early as 12,000 years ago. That is a really, really long time ago. They made this discovery while excavating an ancient fireplace that was built and used by hunter-gatherers. In it, they found an array of objects, including stone tools, bird bones, and four burned wild tobacco seeds. The finding marks the earliest known evidence of tobacco use. Before now, the oldest signs of tobacco use were detected in a 3,300-year-old pipe that contained traces of nicotine. Researchers believe that the people who left the burned seeds behind either smoked or chewed the tobacco for the purpose of enjoying the effects of the drug. The discovery indicates that tobacco use first appeared among native societies in the Americas during the Ice Age. At the time, the region was likely a marshland with a cool climate, which dried up around 9,500 years ago. Researchers know very little about the culture of these early users. The habit spread globally after the arrival of Europeans over 500 years ago. Early tobacco enthusiasts knew little about the potential harmful effects, it seems. Today, there are an estimated 1.3 billion tobacco users, and the World Health Organization blames its use for 8 million deaths every year. Neanderthals were smarter than we think. England's Althorpe estate has served as the seat of the aristocratic Spencer family since the 16th century. It's most famous as the childhood home of Princess Diana, who lived there from the time she was a teenager until she married Prince Charles. But the site's history dates back much further, as archaeologists recently realized. While working at the Northampton estate, they discovered pieces of seashells that they could tell had been deliberately reshaped. They assumed that the fragments dated back to the Middle Ages, but radiocarbon dating revealed that they are at least 40,000 years old, meaning they may have been crafted by Neanderthals. The Neanderthals' presence in Britain dates back roughly 400,000 years. They left and returned repeatedly over time, as the climate fluctuated between harsh and livable. Roger Mitchell is the executive director of the Institute for Digital Archaeology, which was tasked with carrying out the excavations. He told the British press that the shells are probably not leftover pieces from an ancient meal because Althorpe was even further from the sea at the time than it is now. They are more likely to be decorations or jewelry pieces. This is the latest discovery in a growing body of evidence that challenges our stereotype of Neanderthals as unintelligent, brutish, and barbaric early humanoids without culture or complex social structure. Other findings in recent years indicate that our prehistoric relatives made cave artwork, took care of their sick, and had burial customs. 
oldest human footprints in the Americas. Experts recently published a study detailing the presence of 23,000-year-old footprints in White Sands National Park in New Mexico, dialing back the earliest confirmed human presence in North America by at least 10,000 years. This discovery has changed history. Found on an ancient lake bed, the footprints were made over a several thousand year span during the last glacial maximum, before the glaciers from the last ice age melted. They were created mostly by children and teenagers. The findings mark a turning point in the ongoing debate over who first stepped foot into the Americas, and when. Many researchers suspect that humans reached North America much earlier than the footprints were made, but solid evidence is lacking. In the past, scientists have mistaken bone and rock fragments as human-made tools. One study from last year claims that archaeologists found 26,000-year-old human-made rock artifacts in Mexico, but many experts believe that the objects were naturally formed. The fossilized footprints are a game-changer, not only because their dating seems accurate, but because they were made at a time when researchers previously believed ice sheets blocked people from entering North America. Until relatively recently, most scientists thought that the human presence on the continent dates back no more than 13,000 years to the mysterious Clovis people, who are named for the unique spearheads they left behind. But growing evidence suggests that the Americas were home to pre-Clovis civilizations, and the questions to answer now are who they were and when did they arrive. Ancient Winery Archaeologists have just announced the discovery of an ancient industrial-scale winery at the Kinnis site in modern-day northern Iraq. Dating back 2,700 years to the time of the Assyrian kings, the factory was found near a collection of stone-cut royal carvings that depict sacred animals and rulers praying to the gods. The carvings were created to remind people that they should be loyal to the king, who ordered the construction of the canal that carried water to farmers. In this sense, they were both religious images and propaganda with political motives behind them. Perhaps these carvings also serve to remind the winemakers who it was that ran the show. The winemaking facility consists of 14 installations that were used to press grapes, extract juice, and ferment it into wine. Some of the world's earliest cities were established in Iraq, and some of the first known forms of handwriting appeared at these settlements, which were inhabited by the Assyrians, the Sumerians, and the Babylonians. Like any modern society, they too apparently like to unwind with a glass or two of wine after a long day. How about you? The Last Fugitive of Vesuvius When Mount Vesuvius erupted in 79 AD, hundreds of fugitives in the city of Herculaneum ran for cover, in hopes they'd be rescued by Pliny the Elder's fleet of ships. During the 80s and 90s, archaeologists uncovered the remains of 300 individuals, who gathered in boat sheds and waited for relief that never came. Recently, during the first dig at the site in 25 years, a team of scientists found the partially mutilated remains of a man who died just feet away from the sea while attempting to flee the eruption. Dubbed the last fugitive, he was between 40 and 45 years old when he died. His head was smashed in by a fallen roof beam, and his blood left bright red stains on his bones, speaking to the horror he experienced during his final moments. The pyroclastic flow from Mount Vesuvius hit Herculaneum around 1 o'clock in the morning. A dense, hot cloud of fire and gas barreled toward the sea at 60 miles per hour, giving the town's residents very little time to escape. Although archaeologists believe that the man was a fugitive, they admitted that he may have been a soldier who traveled ashore to help people get to safety. Describing the find as a sensational discovery, Archaeological Park Director Francesco Cirano told Italian News that the remains will be useful for learning more about what the last moments of life were like for Herculaneum's residents. The city was buried in approximately 50 feet of volcanic ash until the early 18th century, when it was discovered during the digging of a well. Using metal blades, Cirano's team plans to carefully chip away at the lava rock that has encased the man for nearly 2,000 years. Ancient Skis Archaeologists discovered an ancient ski on a Norwegian mountaintop in 2014. Dating back some 1,300 years, the remaining lone ski at the site was amazingly still intact, with birch rope and leather bindings. For the next seven years, the team monitored the ice when it thawed during the summertime, in hopes of finding the other ski. It actually finally appeared this year! Measuring just over 6 feet long, the second ski was found just 16 feet from the first one. 
While the pair represents the best preserved skis on record, skiing likely dates back much further. Ski fragments and artwork depicting the activity from as early as 6000 BC have been found. But this is the first time experts have uncovered intact bindings that show how people used the skis. They show signs of extensive repair, indicating that they were valuable and costly to replace. The two skis are not identical, which suggests that they came from two different pairs. The fate of their owner remains a mystery. Experts believe that the person may have taken them off to hunt and lost them, or that the individual may have been in a skiing accident. As the ice continues to melt more than ever before, there is still a chance that researchers will find clues to the owner's fate. Crusader's Sword While diving off the Carmel Coast in Israel recently, amateur scuba diver Shlomi Katzen found a collection of ancient artifacts, including anchors, pottery fragments, and a 900-year-old sword that may have belonged to a crusader knight. He reported the nearly three-foot-long blade and other items to archaeologists from the Israel Antiquities Authority, who described the perfectly preserved iron sword as a beautiful and rare find. It was used between 1095 and 1291 during the Crusader period. The anchors that Katzen discovered date back 4,000 years to the Late Bronze Age. Katzen's finds mark the latest of several recent discoveries of ancient artifacts in the area, which has natural coves that functioned as a refuge for merchant ships during storms. Many of these vessels left behind valuable archaeological artifacts that are just now being found, thanks to waves and shifting undercurrents, which move the sands along the sea bottom. IAA Marine Archaeology Unit Director Kobe Charvet told NPR that even small storms can shift sands, revealing certain parts of the seabed while burying others. Ancient objects are also surfacing more often because leisure diving is on the rise. Charvet emphasized the importance of leaving any discoveries in place and reporting them to the authorities so they can be documented properly. Katzen received a Certificate of Appreciation of Good Citizenship for alerting the IAA to the sword, which will go on public display after it's been cleaned and restored. Tempting as it might be to grab these treasures for themselves, it's possible divers have recovered other valuable items and simply skipped reporting them to the authorities. Prehistoric Artwork While excavating near the village of Kondergay in southern Siberia recently, archaeologists uncovered a 4,000-year-old geoglyph depicting a bull. Found near the border with Mongolia, the ancient artwork is the first-ever discovery of its kind in the immediate region and in Central Asia. It's twice as old as the famous Nazca Lines in Peru, and 1,000 years older than the iconic White Horse Geoglyph in England. The artwork was discovered at an early Bronze Age burial site along with some ceramics from the period. Measuring 10 by 13 feet, it was made by carefully arranging locally sourced sandstone pebbles. The image is only partially intact due to damage from road construction during the 1940s, which ruined the creature's head and torso. It was identified as a bull by its backside and tail, which remain intact. The excavation leader told the news that the animal is typical of early Bronze Age cultures in Central Asia. She further explained that bulls were replaced by deer later during Scythian times, but the nature of the stone composition makes it unique among all other petroglyphs that have been found throughout the region. The team who discovered the artwork hope that it will become a protected site, which will help protect it for future generations. Ancient Egyptian Sculptures The Grand Avenue of Sphinxes was the most important route that ran through the ancient Egyptian city of Luxor, and perhaps in all of Egypt. Dating back nearly 3,000 years, the 1.7-mile-long road was lined on both sides with hundreds of sphinxes with ram heads. The statues faced one another from opposite sides of the avenue, as if to protect its travelers. As part of an ongoing project to restore the Great Avenue of Sphinxes, Archaeologists recently discovered three of these sculptures. They plan to place the sphinxes back where they stood during ancient times in the city of Thebes. The statues represent the god Amun-Ra, who is depicted as having the head of a ram and the body of a lion, according to archaeologist Abdel Rahim. They were found near the Temple of Karnak, which was dedicated to Amun-Ra. It was built sometime between 4,000 and 2,000 years ago. This site will become an open-air museum allowing visitors to travel the pathway between the temples of Luxor and Karnak, 
which functioned as two of the most significant religious centers in ancient Egypt. The Lost Chu Very little is known about the ancient Chu. According to Chinese legend, the first ancestor in the Chu royal bloodline was Zhu Rong, known as the God of Fire. He acted as the advisor of Emperor Shun, in charge of observing the weather and everything related to fire, such as preventing forest fires and controlling burning grass. At the end of the Shang dynasty, Zhu Rong's descendants traveled south to the Henan province, where they established the capital of the Chu people at Danyang. From here, the kingdom expanded through the area, conquering many of the more primitive barbarians who were still living in China at that time. They called them barbarians. We don't know who they were. They then became one of the most powerful kingdoms in China for about 800 years, from 1030 to 223 BC. From what historians can scrape together, the Chu people were quite extraordinary. Not only did they believe in ghosts, but they also believed in magic and witchcraft. Like many ancient kingdoms of the time, they believed that death was merely a transition to another form of life. And much like other cultures at that time, the most important people in society were buried with precious treasures that they could take with them to the next world. Jade and bronze figures, musical instruments, bamboo scrolls, and more. They worshipped their ancestors, the legendary firebird phoenix, the sun, and the mountains. But after conquering many tribes of barbarians and ruling for nearly a millennia, the Chu kingdom was defeated by the king of Qin. He marched 600,000 soldiers on the capital and completely wiped them out. It was the beginning of Ying Zheng's plan to unify all of China under one banner. After the brutal defeat, the Chu kingdom collapsed and the culture vanished. Fiji's Lost Culture Before the Europeans ever stumbled upon the island of Fiji, it was populated by the indigenous Fijians. These people practiced rituals at megalithic stone formations that they called Naga. These were giant stone structures, kind of like the megaliths found throughout the UK. Only archaeologists are pretty sure they know what the Fijians used them for. Each naga had stone altars that the locals would use to perform rituals to promote fertility. They wanted to have many children, wanted their animals to have many babies, and their crops to grow. They also may have used these stone structures to communicate with their dead relatives in more secretive rites and rituals. The nature of these rituals has remained largely a mystery, due to the extreme privacy of the families who performed them. Many ancestors of the tribes have almost no knowledge of them, other than that approaching certain areas would displease the gods. By the 1800s, Europeans had taken interest in the island for trade. The islanders had sea cucumbers that were seen as delicacies to Europeans, and they had sandalwood that was very valuable. Foreigners pretty much pillaged everything until the sandalwood was gone. Then, by the 1850s, the Kingdom of Bao had risen up to conquer most of Fiji, thanks to the Europeans trading muskets to the tribe. But the Kingdom of Bao's rule was short-lived. Roman Catholic missionaries washed over the island and turned the indigenous people into Catholics. Within just 50 years, Fiji was settled by Europeans, their great stone naga were forgotten, and their ancient customs suddenly evaporated. The Tarteso Civilization The Tarteso Civilization literally burnt their own kingdom to the ground. It happened 2,500 years ago in what is now Spain. The capital of the kingdom held the same name as the civilization, Tartesos. It was a port city that emerged in the 9th century BC, and according to ancient texts left behind by the Greeks, was an almost mythical culture, extremely rich in both technology and resources. They mastered shipbuilding and metallurgy, they spread their cultural beliefs throughout the area of southern Spain, and then they vanished without a trace. In fact, Tartesos is believed to be the first recorded civilization in the Western Mediterranean. But how and why did the Tartesos civilization burn to the ground? Excavations at their ancient capital between 2014 and 2018 showed proof that the civilization vanished following one great big fire. There were events leading up to this great finale, what some archaeologists believe could have been a series of earthquakes and tsunamis that wiped out their coastal settlements. Whatever happened, it only took about 50 years. All of their small cities were destroyed to the point that all that remained was their capital. Now, nobody knows exactly what happened for sure. That being said, archaeological evidence suggests that the Tartesos kingdom burned down their own city after a great feast and dozens of animal sacrifices. These sacrifices included animals like horses and cows and dogs. All of these animals were brought to a single place and butchered, just before the locals set fire to everything. It looks like they saw the end was nigh and wanted to go out with a bang. And from there, the Tarteso civilization disappeared. The Land of Kush 
The Great Kingdom of Kush is one of the most mysterious ancient civilizations in the world. The geographical location for the land of Kush is in modern-day Sudan, located just south of Egypt. We know today that the kingdom dominated this area of Africa from 2500 BC all the way to 300 AD. That's a massive amount of time, almost 3,000 years. This was a huge territory and a very powerful kingdom, one that erected even more pyramids than the Egyptians. And yet today, there is almost no mention of them anywhere in popular history. While the details are uncertain, according to religious traditions, the kingdom of Kush has been directly linked to Kush with a C, the grandson of Noah from the Bible. In the Bible, it's written that Noah's descendants lived throughout northeast Africa, and considering his grandson was named Kush and the kingdom became known as Kush with a K, it's a pretty specific coincidence. There was a lot of engagement between the Egyptians and the kingdom of Kush. They traded, fought wars, and each one adopted fragments of the other's culture. In 1500 BC, the great pharaohs of Egypt marched south and conquered the Kush capital of Kerma, establishing their own forts and building their own temples. Egyptian rule continued until the 11th century BC, when a new era of Kush kings rose to power and took their land back. This kind of fighting went on and on until climate change caused drought and famine. At around the same time, the king of Aksum rose in the south. By the 4th century AD, Kush had lost all its power. The Mughal Empire The Mughal Empire only ruled for about 300 years, and yet it was one of the most important kingdoms in India's history. In 1650, the Mughal Empire was a major power in the Islamic world. Aside from them, there was the Ottoman Empire, as well as the more recently developed Safavid Persian Empire. In 1690, the Mughal Empire controlled almost all of India, with a population of about 160 million people. They organized themselves based on a system developed by the legendary Mongolian leader Genghis Khan. But this should be no surprise, considering the empire was founded by Prince Babur, who was descended from Genghis Khan on his mother's side. He conquered northern India in 1526, defeated the Sultan Ibrahim Shah Lodi, and then cemented the Mughal Empire's presence in the subcontinent. The Mughal Empire was responsible for building the Great Taj Mahal, an iconic image and major tourist site after the Emperor Shah Jahan's wife died in 1627. The Taj Mahal was built as a mausoleum in memory of his beloved wife, a labor that took nearly 22 years to complete in her honor. Like all empires, the Mughals eventually fell. There was a great revolt in 1672. The rulers lost much of their authority and began to lose certain regions, such as modern-day Afghanistan. And by 1707, the British showed up up, and that was pretty much the end for the once great empire. The Kukuteni Tripilian Culture The Kukuteni Tripila culture, also known as the Tripolie culture, dates back all the way back to 5500 BC. That's over 7,500 years ago. They prospered in Eastern Europe for just under 3,000 years. Their territory spread from the Carpathian Mountains all the way south to Moldova, encompassing huge areas of western Ukraine and Romania. These people weren't exactly part of a kingdom, but instead a society of loosely connected Neolithic settlements. They all belonged to the same culture, but they were massively spread out. Despite this, the Tripolia culture is responsible for building some of the most impressive settlements in Europe before true civilizations took root. Some of the first villages contained anywhere from 20,000 to 46,000 people. But what's really strange is that most of their settlements had a maximum lifetime of 80 years. They would burn their settlements to the ground and then rebuild somewhere else. And despite obvious archaeological evidence of this, historians have no idea why they did it for thousands of years. They literally destroyed their cities just about once every century, just to move and build a new city a few miles down the road. The Urartu Archaeologists in modern Turkey have been making some pretty incredible discoveries in regard to the lost Urartu kingdom. For five years, archaeologists have been investigating the remains of the Urartu in the Van province. Specifically, they've been digging at Kavustepe Castle, which dates back to around 3,000 years ago. Another incredible monument that has withstood the test of time is the Van Fortress, built between the 9th and 7th century BC. The fortress is home to inscriptions carved across two generations of kings, King Darius and then Xerxes. The archaeologists most recently uncovered burials containing the remains of Urartu citizens from 2,750 years ago. 
These bodies were found in old and forgotten necropolises, buried until now under layers of dirt. But just who were the Urartu? They were a kingdom that rose up in the Iron Age and lived high in the mountainous regions of northern Turkey, Iran, and Mesopotamia. They came onto the scene in the middle of the 9th century BC, wielded a massive political power throughout the Middle East for 300 years, and then were suddenly gone. All that remains today are a few ruins, including the mysterious Kavustepe Castle, high up in the mountains. It was used a lot during the Middle Ages, and it holds a lot of information that scientists are trying to uncover. There are all kinds of hidden rooms, niches, inscriptions, buried pots, remains of sacrificial animals, all probably used to honor Haldi, the god of war. The greatest mystery of all is what happened to the Urartu. Some historians say it was probably the neighboring Assyrians or the Scythians, the Sumerians or the Medes. They had many enemies who wanted nothing more than to wipe them out. The Etruscans The Etruscans flourished in Italy hundreds of years before Rome was even founded. They showed up in the 8th century BC and vanished in the 3rd century BC. This was the original Italian kingdom that was ultimately destroyed and then assimilated into what became Rome. But believe it or not, the Romans adopted a lot from the Etruscans, including their clothing, their religious beliefs, and even their architecture. There are plenty of Etruscan tombs, statues, temples, and examples of art still standing in Italy today. The Etruscans are considered Italy's first great civilization. Before Rome, the Etruscans were banded together by a common language, religion, and culture. However, they weren't really under a single rule. All the cities in ancient Etruria were independent states. They each had their own ruler and developed independently of one another. They developed their own manufacturing, art, and everything else. Coastal cities evolved at a faster pace, and the whole region prospered from trading with each other. All that trading and prosperity came to a dramatic halt in the 3rd century BC. Up until then, Rome had been the friendly little neighbor. But as Rome became more powerful, it began to flex its muscles. The Etruscans were first invaded by a northern Celtic tribe, with the attacks going on for somewhere around 200 years. In 280 BC, when Rome finally defeated all the major cities of the Etruscans, there was nothing they could do except crumble and submit to the great Roman Empire. The Grand Duchy of Lithuania The Grand Duchy of Lithuania was an extremely powerful kingdom in Eastern Europe from between the 14th and 16th century. Before then, Lithuania had been a bunch of loosely banded tribes. As the Teutonic and Livonian knights from Germany became a threat, the Lithuanian tribes united and formed a Grand Duchy. It was imperative for these people to stand together and protect Lithuanian lands from the advancing German knights and their allies. At the time, the Germans were busy trying to defeat everyone in sight. They had already conquered a massive part of Russia, pushing down into the Baltic Sea and the Black Sea. The Grand Duchy of Lithuania held off the Germans until the late 1500s. At that point, they had to go to Poland for help. The Polish king forced them to become a part of Poland in exchange for protection. The two created a union. Lithuania adopted the Polish customs and their language and basically became a part of Poland. This was from between 1569 until the end of the 18th century, when the Russian Empire took Lithuania for itself. Lithuania did not become its own individual kingdom again until the 1990s, when the Soviet Union collapsed and they could finally once again have independence. The Gandhara The Gandhara kingdom has been extinct for a very long time. They lasted from the 6th century BC to the 11th century AD. At 1700 years, the length of time the Gandhara existed is pretty impressive. They really hit their stride in the 5th century AD, under the rule of the Buddhist Kushan kings. This was when the kingdom controlled huge parts of northwestern India, in what is today Pakistan, and much of eastern Afghanistan. It was an interesting kingdom because they were located at the crossroads of East and West, two very different cultures. It was a bizarre fusion of Greek and Buddhist beliefs, especially following the invasion of Alexander the Great into northwestern India. In fact, the Gandharan city of Taxila was one of the only places in the ancient world that was important in both Hinduism and Buddhism, while still being influenced by things happening as far away as the Mediterranean. But all the fun and games came to a great end when the Huns showed up in 450 AD and captured the entire kingdom. They didn't just take one city, they conquered the entire kingdom. And because these are the notorious Huns we're talking about, they didn't care at all about the unique convergence of cultures, they didn't adopt any of it, and instead tried to destroy everything. After 450 AD, the cultural uniqueness of the Gandhara kingdom was gone. So too were all of its people, tragically wiped off the map. Thanks for watching! Which Forgotten Kingdom do you find the most fascinating? Let me know in the comments below! And remember to subscribe if you haven't already! See you soon! Bye!